what we have now is a panel discussion on a range of issues, including on some of the topics that we have already touched on, especially under Slava's uh, presentation. And uh, I have a number of um, colleagues here with me. And what I would like to do for a start is I would like to ask each one of them to briefly introduce themselves and perhaps uh, just tell us with one line how they have engaged with, with the center so far. Because what we would like uh, to engage with uh, the audience and our speakers about is the value of the research in um, outside uh, academia. I'm an academic. Of course, I will tell you that research is valuable and we should be funded. But um, this is my job. This is what I'm being paid for. But we need, as academics, to work closely together with stakeholders, with businesses, with public sector organizations to bring the benefits of our research into uh, society. So this is the topic, if you like, or the high-level aim of this panel. So um, you know uh, who I am, so I'm not going to introduce myself. So if I can start with Bill. Hello everybody, my name is Bill Mansfield. I work for an insurance company that you've probably never heard of, but a number of you may actually have uh, this insurance as part of your contract of employment because we do actually insure a number of educational establishments, including universities. Um, so I'm head of market insight and analytics. My company is called UNUM, U-N-U-M, UNUM. And I've been engaging with um, Maria Fasli's um, team for about two and a half years now uh, in the guise of a DAVE, uh, a Data and Analytics Innovation Voucher, which was completed oh, about <coughs> two months ago. Hi there, my name is Stephen Simpkin. I'm a Data Science Fellow at Essex County Council. Um, I think Slava's done a lot of the hard work for me earlier in his presentation talking through ECTA, um, so I'm happy to field any questions you may have on any of the specific kind of projects that you've seen today, um, but then also I'll happily um, back Maria up by talking glowingly about the importance of data and research in local government. John? Yeah, hi, my name is John Jones, I work for Norfolk County Council and the Head of Environment, so my, my interest today I think is mostly around green infrastructure and the, the use of that sort of data to ensure that Norfolk targets, um, targets its energy and its resources very effectively in terms of both protecting the environment um, into the future, but also um, recognizing how the environment can actually help people as well, and making those connections um, increasingly, I think, are very important to me and the team I work with mm. in Norfolk. Thank you. Um, so I've got a number of potential questions in mind. And uh, obviously, we would value your input and your own questions. So to kickstart the, the conversation, I would like our panelists, if they do not mind, uh, to tell us how their work or their role within the organization has been strengthened or has benefited from engaging with research, engaging with, with, with the, the center or uh, universities uh, and academics in general. So I don't know who would like to start. I, I can kind of okay. expand a bit upon what we started kind of hearing about earlier. Um, so I, I guess first it's worth talking about the, the kind of role um, and the, the role of Data Science Fellow. It might be quite unique to kind of local authority organisations, but it's a reflection of our aspirations you heard earlier. Um, it's a reflection of the increased um, uh, acknowledgement of the importance of kind of data and research in local government. And I, I think um, part of our uh, relationship with kind of local academia and with the centre has been kind of to help create that culture. I think people within these kind of data teams uh, were long sold a long time ago about how um, kind of data and analysis and data science and predictive analytics 
could help improve kind of the way we kind of work within local government. But I think outside of those kind of data teams, maybe that message wasn't sinking in as well as it could have been. Um, I think within the last two or three years, I've seen the biggest kind of shift in the kind of culture of data use within senior leaders at Essex and, and outside of Essex County Council. And I think more and more people are buying into the fact that um, there is kind of lots of benefits through data and analysis and research. Um, so, I mean, first and foremost, I think um, the, the kind of centre and, and local academia have been instrumental in kind of helping us kind of create that uh, argument for research and analysis and um, they've been able to kind of demonstrate the kind of benefits and also they've kept us kind of they haven't kept us kind of static they've, they've kept us thinking about what um, new emerging kind of methodologies and technologies might be appropriate um, we have some experience in kind of the use of predictive analytics um, but things move fast in the kind of data world so it's been fantastic kind of being kind of kept in the loop of any new and emerging methodologies. Um, on the one hand, it's great to kind of be involved in these discussions about kind of the use of visual imagery to maybe improve kind of things like uh, local policing, um, but we've also kind of balanced that out with some of the more kind of uh, simple applications of kind of data science and research methodologies. So I think we saw the kind of roadmap earlier of some of the bigger projects we're involved in, but also kind of thinking a bit more kind of um, uh, looking at kind of how data and research can improve some of the business as usual activities we look to try and kind of create uh, kind of simple solutions to some of our kind of day-to-day -day work and I think um, today it's probably the um, we found a, a really mutually beneficial way of working with academics and, and with the centre uh, and long may that continue into the, the next year. John as we are in the public sector. Okay um, well the story from Norfolk slightly different from, from the one in Essex. Um, I've worked for Norfolk County Council for about 12 years, and ab about three years ago, my managing director at the time, who was relatively new to the position, asked me to write her briefing note because she was going to meet the vice chancellor at the University of East Anglia. So she said, you know, what, what do we do with the university? I don't want to turn up um, without a clue. So anyway, um, I thought it was a relatively straightforward <coughs> task until I started to look quite carefully at what we had actually been doing over this period. It sort of, it had been developing organically, almost intuitively, built on, you know, personal relationships with different people like, you know, Andrew Lovett, Andy Jones, people who are not here, people like Paul Dolan, lots, lots of people where over time, different projects had been developed jointly and where the public sector was working really closely with the university. So by the time I'd, I'd written the paper, I was quite surprised. I was sort of, I was almost impressed. I thought, this, this looks pretty good, actually. So um, I punted the paper off, and then the managing director came back after the meeting saying, That's, that was so helpful, you know, that was really brilliant. What, you know, what, what, what sort of formal arrangement have you got with the university? And I said, well, there isn't one really. So anyway, that started a kind of, a sort of process which involved um, Kevin Hiskett, who's head of School of Environment at the EWA. He was also a bit surprised at what we what we were all doing together. So anyway, to sort of get to the point, I suppose we we decided. Well, we this this is a really good starting point. We haven't got a blank sheet of paper. We've got a proven track record of actually doing things together. Can we be a bit smarter about it? Can we sort of work more closely at the front end of these collaborations to try and agree shared priorities mm -hmm. and to get a bit more strategic about it? So I, I would say that over the last 18 months, we, we have sort of stepped up a gear or two mm -hmm. in terms of what we're doing. So we've, we've entered a formal collaborative platform agreement. That means that staff between the two organizations can interchange, um, means that we can bid for work together or offer one another work. Um, that's kind of really important in the public sector because we're tied down with all sorts of complicated, unnecessary procurement rules. We can't just give work to people we like, even if they are very good at what they do. Um, so this, this agreement, if you like, gives us that type of platform 
where we can start working much, much more closely together. And hopefully, we should be able to build on that. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, so us sponsoring doc doctorships and, and, you know, students have been coming to my office now for four or five years um, doing year industry work where they, our students, get a lot out of the experience. We get a fantastic return on our time and investment with those students. I mean, they've got a lot of energy, a lot of youth and enthusiasm. So I've, I've got lots of positive things to say really about why it makes sense to work together, why I think research needs to get real and practical. I see that with the students that have worked with me, they really love the idea that they're doing a dissertation where I can say, well, you know, write it and we will be trying to implement some of that. It's not just going to sit on a shelf. So I think, yeah. Um, so we have an example of both a bottom-up approach as well as a top-down approach. But if I may add, Stephen, I believe the, um, the kind of work that the University of Essex has been doing with Essex County Council has actually been both ways. So we do have a number of people across academic departments and, and faculties at the University of Essex that have started um, working with Essex County Council and these collaborations go back years. And it's been more recently where the top-down approach has been sort of adopted to try and bring uh, the two together. Am I? Um, yeah, the, the kind of ECTA programs looking to try and formalise that uh, in, in, in some sort of way, um, thus being able to kind of use some of the learning from previous kind of experience working together um, to ensure that we're working as effectively as, pos as possible going forward. But there's always been kind of little overlaps mm -hmm. in from kind of my world. I've, I've been in the data and analysis kind of team for t kind of 12 years um, and colleagues at, at the <coughs> university. And it, the, we have always kind of overlapped, but perhaps not to the extent and in the, the kind of effective way that we're doing today. So, uh, Bill, um, you represent industry, businesses, well, not everyone, uh, obviously, uh, but uh, it would be helpful to hear your views and your experience of engaging with the university and research and, and, and academics and how yeah, you... Yeah, sure. So I guess the starting point is just to say that I come from the world of insurance. Before that, I was in banking. Both professions which have always been based on data science, mm -hmm. frankly. In insurance, the data scientists we call actuaries, and in banking, we call them risk analysts or credit analysts or something like that. The difference, though, is that I'm actually a marketing analyst. I work in a sales, straight marketing function, where traditionally, you know, no numeracy was assumed whatsoever. The most advanced technology was probably a set of colouring pencils or something like that. It's a standard joke with marketing. But the world has changed. And if you're good at maths nowadays, in the world of business, you can become an accountant or an actuary. You can also become a marketing analyst, which is where I've ended up through uh, a finance route. Um, the big difference, though, is with that tradition of actuaries, credit analysts, etc. traditionally that's all been internal data. And so organisations with big market shares, lots of internal data that go on for a long period of time, they're very, very good at pricing risk and understanding what's going on. Um, the big change, though, is, has been the accessibility of external data, and that's where my role comes in, so I've got a small team, it's just four people. The work on combining external data, we heard references this morning about the FAME database, and the Dun & Bradstreet database, I'm working with that alongside all of my internal data and from that we can build benchmarking, propensity models, all around finding growth in the market, and that's what we're doing. So we're looking to take our propositions out to more business customers and organisations like universities in the UK so that we can reach more people with our insurance. Um, the reason for engaging with Essex, uh, I first engaged with Essex about five or six years ago. It was actually the Institute of Social and Economic Research. They do some brilliant research um, over in that part of the university. 
that we actually used for some of our thought leadership programs, actually looking at patterns of disability and an inability to work in the UK, so it's real thought leadership stuff. Um, that kind of evolved, and we're very, very pleased with our partnership with Essex at that level. So I learned something about the data centre and the whole Essex setup. Then um, heard about the data science department. Maria was new on the scene about two or three years ago, and we started talking about how we might make use of the data and analytics side to get hard to get data, data that we can't get from sources like Dun & Bradstreet or Bureau Van Dyke. And the data that we're specifically interested in is web-based data. The, uh, the DAVE, the Data and Analytics Innovation uh, Voucher, was about trying to see if we could identify HR directors and specifically moving HR directors on the web. We had um, a postdoc um, working on this. Uh, it was meant to be a week, but it ended up being a bit more than that because I think he found it quite interesting and I was absolutely delighted that he did that. And he built Python code to go through Google to actually find uh, HR directors on the web. Um, so that is kind of phase one, is to actually find them. Then the next challenging part will be, and I hope we move on to a knowledge transfer partnership to start looking at this, migrating ones. The reason we're interested in, in uh, people like that is that they are big decision makers when it comes to actually taking our type of insurance. So if we can identify them, um, you know, that, that's a valuable thing for us to do. It is public domain data. We're not doing the Cambridge Analytica thing, far from it. This is all public domain data. If I had a big enough team, they could all sit there all day and they could go online and they could find this data themselves. The difference here is that it's using code to automate that search process, capture that data. We set it up, so I already had a list of HR directors and effectively we ran an experiment with the postdoc against the same list of companies that I had, it was around a thousand companies, to see if he could find the same contacts. And there was quite an encouraging outcome. Um, yes, I mean the strike rate wasn't as high as this data that I'd actually paid for, but it was for a first um, prototype, it was an encouraging outcome. So we're moving on to the next phase. So I would say, what has it done for us? It's proven concept. There is something in the idea. Nobody's doing this sort of stuff in my part of the market anyway. Um, we've been introduced to Python coding. It's the first time um, somebody outside of the IT function in my organization uh, is using Python coding, and it's influenced the way that I've just recruited my newest member of staff. So we've been very excited by what's come out of um, our liaison with Essex University. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So um, obviously there are, these are good examples and they are examples of where things are working. Uh, but Slava in his presentation, and I'm sure a lot of you will be aware and familiar with examples where things have not worked. And some of the challenges that have been touched on um, in Slava's presentation include things like communication, for instance, between an academic or an academic team and a public sector organization or a business. Because we are, we, as academics, we are often being told we speak in tongues or we speak in languages that others may not understand. So I would like to start with this issue of communication and ask our panel members how it has been for them, uh, what sort of good experiences or bad experiences or how you feel you have overcome it and any lessons that you would like to draw? Any takers? Um, John? Yeah, I'll say a few words. I, th I think the point that was raised much earlier about um, working to publish a paper as opposed to producing um, something usable for somebody like me that's the area that's tricky. 
Okay. Because, um, you know, quite rightly, you know, universities, their reputation centers on producing really good, robust academic mm -hmm. work. <coughs> so I'm always sort of um, pushing them away from that occasionally. Um, so I think, I think the, the, the trick really is to see whether or not you can kind of combine those two things. The, the, I don't think they need to be mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. but you do have to sort of agree it right at the beginning. There may very well be an excellent academic paper in this, but first can we, can we get to this and then you can continue with, with the paper. So I think that's one of the areas mm -hmm. where we put some time into trying to manage everybody's expectations. Mm. So it's about managing and having clear expectations from the beginning. I think so. I think, it, uh, I think that, as I say, I don't think there's any problem with producing first-rate academic papers. But, but you know, I've, I've got a set of politicians who expect results, and it's, it's a kind of different dynamic. Um, so we just have to sort of bridge the gap there, I think. Mm. Stephen? Um, I guess from, from my perspective, um, some of the, the skills we saw on the slide earlier where, where at in Essex we want to develop were things like natural language processing and the use of risk stratification models. Now, if we kind of took some of the outputs from them to our decision makers and talked about the kind of accuracy of the model and the sensitivity and, and things like that, it would just go over their head <laughs> um, and they'd probably gloss over. But they want to know is um, what difference is it going to make um, and I think over time with the projects we've been involved in to date we've been able to slowly build up an evidence base for these kind of quite complicated quite sophisticated approaches and try and kind of convey the messages in, in plain English form. Um, it didn't happen quickly and we're still trying to kind of build that evidence base um, but it's only improving and has improved over the last year or so. Um, and we're, when we talk about upskilling within Essex County Council, we're, we're purely not talking about um, our analytics team learning new technical skills. We want to upskill kind of our senior leaders and our decision makers on the theoretical side of these different methodologies we're talking about. We don't need everyone to understand all the kind of ins and outs and mechanisms of your natural language processing, your risk stratification modelling, but we need to, them to kind of understand what we mean when we're talking about it, where it might be a suitable application um, for their kind of day-to-day -day decision making, and what output they might expect if we adopt one of these these methods. Um, beyond that, they don't need to know all the kind of uh, technical outputs. Okay, thank you. Bill, have you found communicating with us as uh, academic team challenging, interesting, uh, easy? Uh, definitely the last two. Um, I think it has been easy. I think it has been interesting. Has it been challenging? I think it's been quite smooth, actually. You I can mean, be when honest, No, no, I am being honest. I, I don't set out to flatter at all. I am being completely candid. Um, I think um, you got it straight away, what we were trying to do, what we we're interested in. Um, again, it was interesting this morning, some of the slides about, um, in fact, I'm sorry, it was this afternoon, it was Slava's slides about, you know, social networks and getting to know people as people. I think the example was premiership football, which is the cause of war rather than anything else maybe in this country. But um, I do agree with that. One of the things that I think we definitely got right is that although my office is south of London in Dorking, if anybody's, any of you have heard of Dorking, little market town, obviously Colchester is a bit of a way, but I was always keen to go along and meeting face to face, there's just no substitute. I do feel because of that we got on a wavelength. Mm -hmm. I feel you understood what we were trying to do. And I think the other thing that we probably got right was letting you get on with it, bluntly. It did take a while to get going, but it did get going. I did wonder at one point whether it would mm. actually, um, you know, take off, but it did. And when it did take off, it took off very quickly and it became quite exciting quite quickly. Mm. So I've, I've got positives, really. Mm. Well, the interesting point, though, you talk about challenge, mm. That is now, 
it's not working with you, it's now. So one of the things I really like is the way that, as a result of this, we've got this proof of concept. It was self-contained, did it your own way, no constraints of working in a financial services organisation, didn't involve any of our data. You know, this was kind of looking outwards. And there is a freedom there that actually mm -hmm. I'm now realising as I try and get this to take root internally. Um, <coughs> that is the big change. So it took me three weeks to persuade my IT colleagues that my team needed Python, that it's not an IT tool, it is a marketing analytics tool. I had to jump through so many hoops to get that. Three weeks in my world, I think is a long time. I don't know what it is in your world, but in my world, that's far too long. Um, then I'm now um, at a point at which um, there are concerns with the way we get onto the web and the way we already have some um, global contracts with some of the organisations that own these web search organisations. And if we go into these websites that would allow us to have access, what about the security issues on being able to see our own Unum data? You know, I'm now having to go through that process. But, you see, this puts me in a really good position because I know there's something in it. I've got that proof of concept. So it's worth going through the internal mm. process, which is there for a reason. This is financial services compliance. So I would say that's proven to be the most challenging mm. piece in the whole thing. Well, different organisations will have different structures of going through the motions of getting things approved. It can be a major stumbling yeah. block. Yeah. Um, but you need perseverance Absolutely. and clarity in yeah. what it is that you are after and what you are trying to do. Um, it was mentioned uh, in Slava's presentation and we touched uh, I think one of you touched on this uh, earlier during this discussion. Um, sharing data, which is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, it's always a stumbling block. We are always, we always appear to be learning the same lessons. Uh, we keep hearing the same story of projects attempting to start and then you get blocked because organizations cannot share um, data and I feel we need to move we are learning lessons but we need to move beyond the learning lessons and into some kind of action so I would value your your thoughts and an input uh, in this so I don't know who would like it's not an easy topic I appreciate but we are not here to answer easy questions um, I mean I can only start by kind of echoing the same kind of problems we've we've come across um, that Slava talked on, on earlier. Um, what I am seeing is fewer and fewer of those kind of types of kind of episodes happening. Um, I'm finding that there is a big appetite for sharing data and people really buy into the benefits that kind of bringing together their data and insight will bring. Um, it's how best to try and translate that into something which is um, kind of quicker and easier to do. So a lot of the pilot projects which were on this kind of screen earlier, um, they were almost kind of nine months, 12 months from concept through to kind of producing these kind of risk models and outputs. Um, but most of the time wasn't spent kind of doing the work at a desk. It was kind of um, trying to create a framework to safely and securely match data and then uh, ensuring that kind of um, the people within each partner organisation are able to kind of ex make the bespoke extractions and how that will tie together. Um, but once that framework has been set up, each kind of subsequent project which followed did reduce that time slightly. Um, we had a good framework in place and processes to kind of anonymise, th sorry, th anonymise data at source and kind of tie it all together. Um, it's still the biggest kind of part of these projects. Um, we've still not got the balance right between spending time doing the actual analysis and kind of coming up with what would be um, appropriate um, methodologies and solutions to specific problems. The bulk of the time is still kind of doing that kind of chasing and helping people kind of cleanse, audit, and uh, seal alive and, and join data. Um, but it is not as bad as it was two, three years ago. And I think certainly the technologies and the governance are set up to try and do this. Um, we just need to do it in a more sustainable way. 
John? Um, yeah, there's no doubt it is a you know, difficult area occasionally. I mean, in the public sector, um, I have to admit that we're relatively slow to change on some things, um, certainly in terms of data and the use of software, you just, you, you can hit a wall um, in terms of, you know, IT teams blocking things, um, which gives me a problem because I think it, you know, it's, it's frustrating. It means that it, your service is not improving. Mm -hmm. So in fact, the sort of, the technology or not accepting or embracing what the technology can offer can be incredibly sort of protracted sometimes when we're dealing with our IT people. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to explain to people outside the organization, but that's like, you know, that's what it's like. Um, we've had problems, be we've had problems between two universities actually w over copyright, one in Hungary and one in East Anglia, um, where they couldn't agree on something. Wasn't, uh, that wasn't the people that I was dealing with. That was some sort of you know, mysterious presence somewhere, somewhere else. In a uh, back office, somewhere, handling contracts. Somewhere, and you know, we were all kind of, I wonder how long this is going to take at one point. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we got through it. So I don't know, I think you said it, that you've just got to be patient and um, you know, not lose your cool over it sometimes, I think. Mm -hmm. Just be persistent. Your view from uh, the business world? Um, so, as yet, we've not actually exchanged any data. This has been about building a capability to get data, publicly available data, but hard to get data from the web. It's about capability. Um, we do transfer data um, into my team around that propensity thing that I referred to earlier, so um, we do take data. Um, it's corporate data, it's not personal data. We do take data from our, um, our intermediaries that distribute our products, so it's client data. Um, we do that under a non-disclosure agreement every time we set up a formal non-disclosure agreement. It's reviewed by legal every year and it'll be reviewed by the other party. And under that, we can exchange prescribed data. One of the reasons I quite like the idea of a knowledge transfer partnership, you know, um, there's a very good chance we'll move on to that as the next step, is that of course there you end up with somebody who can work in the organisation um, and having somebody kind of on site or quasi on site who feels like one of us, you know, um, that would be a way of kind of mm. potentially getting into our data. That's one of the reasons I quite like the idea of a KTP. So, um, Slava mentioned that as part of the, the work going forward, the Essex Centre for Data Analytics, there will be teams from the various organisations moving around. So I wanted to pick your brains. Um, do you find this a useful idea to have academics coming into uh, your organisations, uh, working on the ground? Essentially, um, without a doubt, um, you know we we all gain from it. We we, we um, get the benefit of expertise that we couldn't possibly fund or resource ourselves, and um, and it tends to be a sort of a network of universities as well. So it isn't just a case of talking to one university. Mm -hmm. You can kind of explain your requirements and um, you know end up with an expert helping you with a particular problem or challenge. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm very much in favour of it. And I, d I think this idea of, you know, almost the sense of being colleagues, you know, sit sitting mm. at the university, some people from Removing my... Removing the yeah, barriers. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, uh, why not? I mean, much more could be achieved if we did that kind of thing. And that's, that's why we entered into this cooperation platform, really, mm. because it enables that to happen much more smoothly. Mm. And um, so I can, I can just get people on my IT systems really quickly now. You know, they don't have to be an employee. Mm. They work for university and can come yeah. into my office. So, um, yeah, really, really positive on that. Stephen? Um, 
Yeah, so I, I, can, I can talk highly about the kind of skills that our internal analytics team possess, um, but none of the people typically apply to be a kind of data scientist. They've come from different backgrounds. They've come from, um, some people have come from the service. Um, we've got a lot of kind of subject matter expertise in specific kind of themes or topics. Um, I mean, uh, only this year have we kind of done away with an adult social care intelligence team and an education intelligence team. Um, we're now non-subject specific, so we're a team of kind of analysts. So a lot of skills there, um, but I think we recognise the kind of uh, expertise that the university bring um, to the table. And when we were kind of looking at X earlier, it's not just about the kind of analytics workforce in, in Essex anymore. We're starting to see it more as um, kind of colleagues in the police as well have a very different set of skills. Um, so the, the, the kind of three of us are, are starting to kind of come up with how best we can all work together. Um, and uh, certainly from a kind of the, the viewpoint of the university, they bring a lot of kind of technical skills. Um, they bring a lot of credi kind of credibility to our work as well. Um, and they are also um, instrumental to hoping, helping us kind of develop our, uh, our skills. Um, so I, I, I look forward to kind of more of that happening. Um, and I think they've kind of areas where kind of universities or police force may be able to kind of learn from our kind of considerable experience of working in mm. local government as well. Phil, would you like an academic in your team? Uh, you mean apart from me? Yes. No, people <laughs> say that I'm far too academic sometimes. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Okay. At a personal level, I think it's a really interesting idea and I'd like to try it out, but I'm not sure about the organisation. I think mm. it would have to be a very clear project. project. Um, when we use academics or experts, they tend to be more like consultants, so they might be attached to, you know, um, one of these business schools and therefore quasi-academic, but really they're consultants and they work on strategic things, and it tends to be board stuff. Um, I, I, would, I was hearing something about what you can do um, earlier on today, and I think it sounds interesting. I would need a case to take into sure. Unum, I think, if I'm honest. Yeah, you can't yeah. just plug in an academic in an yeah. organization and just leave them free. Don't do it. Do not, lo do not let us roam free. We are a disaster. Uh, they would have to be project specific kind of kind of work. Um, so I'm going to ask you a killer question now before I open this to our to our audience for further comments because I know we've got businesses and representatives from the public sector in our audience and they may have their own experiences. How can we as academics better engage with businesses and public sector organizations? What do we need to do better or what do we need to do differently? I told you it was a clear question. I mean, I'm happy to kind of start with just a, a, a small observation. Um, I, I think quite often um, we, we, we know that kind of in, in aca uh, academia, you are right on the cutting edge of these wonderful and new kind of emerging kind of uh, methodologies and technologies, which sometimes is kind of a few steps ahead of where we are within local government. Um, so sometimes it's a Perhaps the conversation needs to start with um, kind of decision makers and finding out what they would like to be able to do, which they currently can't do, and ultimately how can kind of kind of perhaps some of the, the methods and technologies that you're kind of privy to, how that can help kind of do that. Um, I'm always blown away by the types of things that, that which are happening in academ uh, academia, but sometimes some of the kind of best solutions might be the, the, the simplest that we just haven't yeah. considered. Thank you for this. John, any thoughts? Um, I suppose sort of early conversations around um, developing research around practical outcomes, mm -hmm. because um, if, if you build it up right at the beginning with that, that in mind, I mean, we work with the University of East Anglia through um, relationship managers. Um, some are better than others, but, uh, but the, the most useful bit is actually when you start talking to uh, you know, one of the professors about, you know, so we have an issue around a 
problem called ash dieback, where all our ash trees are gradually succumbing to this disease and it's going to sweep through the whole country. So, um, so we've been talking to you know to the university about so how how could we work with you and the John in this centre and some really really good stuff has come out to that very sort of early stage. So. It's not quite the same as commissioning um, a consultant. You know, the, if you commission people, the best approach is normally to have a very clear brief, so that you can kind of develop, you know, to explain exactly what you want, and then whoever's going to do it can tell you how much it will cost. But some of the sort of advantages of working with the university is, is that I, you know, it's like I can't quite write that brief yet. Mm. I, I it's an you know, I might be able to think about where I'd like to end up the end of it but actually I need that kind of input I need people to sort of work with me that's really useful mm -hmm. I think and those, those are the areas where I think there's a huge amount of added value in terms of what we do because it's very I mean it's, it's not an impossible to do that for instance with a commercial consultant which is fair enough isn't it yeah. I mean they have yeah, to turn course. a profit and um, they need to have something very very specific. Yeah, that's and that's fair enough. And I do commission work like that, and that's that's good. That's what you should do if you mm. know exactly what you want. You just market test it, don't you? Um, but I think this is the area where the working together mm. you get out can bring on. real benefits. Yeah. This yeah. dialogue that can help you uh, as well as the academic. Sure. Yeah. To identify where it is that you need to go. Phil, any thoughts? Um, I think you're doing a lot of the right things, to be quite honest. You are running courses on all sorts of technical things. I'm sure you've got Python courses, I'm sure. Now I've got somebody doing Python, I'm sure I'll now make use of it. Um, you've got um, various things that you do through the web, mm -hmm. you're publicising things like this. Um, if I was in your position, I'd be thinking about how you can drive awareness, more awareness, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in the business sector, and that means some form of marketing. Mm -hmm. um, something which I think can work really well is something that has a networking proposition. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really attracted to things where I can go along and I can meet people in other businesses mm -hmm. or in other roles um, that are similar to mine, mm. and I'm re so I'm interested in hearing about what you do, but I'm also interested in sitting in a room with people that have similar roles to me. So you might think more about the networking mm. piece. Okay. So let's open this to our audience now. I know we have representatives from businesses and the public sector. So questions, we want to hear about your experiences. We have someone at the back to get us started. Um, so uh, I work as a consultant with local authorities and if I was going to suggest to a local authority that they were going to engage with, um, with the centre, what basic capabilities should that local authority already have in place to make the most of the partnership? So do they already need a data team? Do they already need to have certain amounts of IT in place? You know, what are the basics the local authority needs to bring to the table? to make the most of this kind of project? I guess this question is uh, directed at me, uh, the based, panel. Based on your experiences, the local authorities and, and, and the academics. Do you have any thoughts? I can um, try and uh, answer, but... I, I don't definitely think there's any kind of prerequisites for what is required from the kind of centre's perspective. Mm. I, I, I think um, different organisations will have a different way they prefer to kind of work with kind of academia. Um, some people may well happily kind of say, here's a problem, can you help me solve it? I think from a kind of sustainability perspective, we wanted to be able to kind of work with kind of um, uh, the, the Centre with Essex University um, on projects as opposed to have them do work for us. So we did need some kind of level of, of skills within our kind of data analytics team, but we uh, are by no means kind of a team of kind of fully fledged data scientists, but between our kind of like 30, 40 strong team, we have kind of all the elements that we think are required to do kind of predictive analytics and data science. Uh, and I think one of the key things from, from, from our side was that we had that kind of leadership buy-in that actually we think we can get better value from kind of 
working collaboratively, doing kind of better stuff, more insightful stuff with our, with our kind of data. Uh, so I think that was key, but um, I, 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 I yeah. guess you probably... So, um, so the centre can engage with different organisations in different ways. It could be through a project, uh, it could be uh, through training, uh, it can be a number of different things. We don't have any specific requirements written down as you need to have a data science team and your data science team needs to include these individuals. And in fact, very often the organizations that come to the center and they are asking for help or they want to engage with us are organizations that they are now embarking on their data journey. They have data, they don't even know whether they are collecting the right data. All they understand is they have problems there are solutions out there, but they actually don't know how to go about it. And, the, um, and of course, you can get in consultants. Consultants, and they have a role in society, and it's a valuable profession. They are obviously, um, they are interested in uh, making a, a profit. They need to have a specific project in mind in, in, mind in, in order to, to work with, with any organization. A university works in a different kind of way. Uh, so we don't sell a product at the end of the day. We're not here to sell a uh, piece of software. In fact, where we can, we will be using open source software to support organizations or uh, do prototypes, for instance, rather than use proprietary. Uh, software and when we are asked for training in specific software packages the stance that we have taken is actually we're not here to deliver this sort of training there are the software companies that have developed these uh, packages that you can refer to we are here to do something else we're here to support the development of skills embed skills ideally within an organization but this takes time and our outreach program has been designed to have this incremental kind of approach. If that answers. We have. Thanks. So this is probably my last question for the day. Um, so I've been wondering a little bit about a few people have talked about central government. And I was wondering in what ways central government um, you find supports what you're trying to achieve, and in what ways central government can be an actual can be a blocker or a hindrance uh, to what you're trying to achieve. Okay, so are you asking us as a centre, or are you asking as a, as a centre, cen but also uh, Essex and as the local authorities trying to achieve uh, data strategy, trying to achieve. Um, I will let my colleagues answer first, and then I'm going to pick it up from the centres. Um, it's not a straight answer to your question, but I think that w w different departments in government are quite different to one another, and you actually have to get your head around what what they're like. So, you know, the Department for Transport is very, very different to TEFRA, for example. So this sort of generic term government, um, underneath that it's a bit more it's a bit more complicated. Um, for the last few years I think central government's been in the throes of all sorts of complicated issues that means that local authorities have been left to some extent to their own devices. Um, I'm not conscious on a regular basis of working to any, I mean, the, the only guidance that I suppose I'm very conscious of is around the planning system and what's expected there. Um, but if you took that out of my working week, you're not left with much in terms of direct influence or guidance from central government. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'd, I'd agree with that. And if um, over the last couple of years, uh, the kind of challenges we've got, which might have stored projects in, in some way, uh, they've all been kind of local ones. And the problems we're trying to start, uh, kind of address have been kind of local issues. Um, so almost had very little um, either kind of guidance one way or another from kind of central government. Um, yeah. 
Um, I, I would agree every department, every government department is different. If you want to work with specific departments, you need to build the relationships with them. So in a way, they're not affecting the work of the center. We do have, for instance, contacts in the Department of Work and Pensions. We have contacts in the Department of Central and Local Government. Um, but you have to work with individual departments and potentially even people or sub-teams within, within teams. I hope that, does that answer your? Yeah, I, mean, I have a lot of experience working across central governments um, and also working to an extent with local authorities. So it's just interesting to see what other people's mm. perspective is of working across government um, and around data sharing, um, but also the areas of research interest which have been published, um, you know, whether, there's a, whether there's any commonalities there that are actually helping you, mm. um, you know, in terms of just fine doing projects Well, uh, hopefully uh, the projects that we will be doing going forward as part of the Essex Center for Data Analytics, because they're focusing on uh, mental health, health in general, uh, supporting economic growth and, and other areas, hopefully they will be of interest to central government. And uh, what we need to do, I think, as a center is find a way that we can engage more with not just our local authorities, but nationally, because I think we have a lot of um, lessons learned and we have done a lot of work that others would benefit uh, at the national stage rather than just keep it to ourselves because we're talking about the use of data and uh, advanced techniques for public good and supporting policy so it's it's relevant across the country. I have one sort of additional observation on the subject which I just thought of while you were talking which is that um, if there is one constant, I think, from government, it's this sense of having to compete for resources. So in other words, you, you, know, you don't get funding in the straightforward way that you used to. So you know, if you're going to get a lot of money from the Department for Transport, you have to make the case. And this, this is where what we're talking about today comes in. Um, you know, evidence of need, evidence of benefit, being able to present your case in an effective, mm -hmm. unclear way, a compelling case, if you like, for this funding in Essex or this funding in Norfolk. It's all, it all traces back to holding the right information and being able to present it mm -hmm. in the best possible light. So I suppose there is that one constant when you're dealing with government. Um, you know, you really will have to show what net gain actually looks like if you're going to be um, <coughs> attracting funding. So I saw a hand, so this will be the last question because I'm aware of, of time. Um, you were talking a bit earlier about the um, difference, difference between universities and consultancies um, and the freedom that universities have to, to, to do bits of work. But um, uh, I work one and a half days a week in, in the centre and you do, you do have that freedom when you're working within the centre, but the other work I do is on specific contracts. So universities do at work as consultants too, or on specific grants. So where you don't have a centre like this, um, or when this, the funding ends for this centre, where, where, do, where does this work then continue, this type of work? Mm. And how does it, how does it continue? Um, okay, so I'm gonna try and partially uh, answer that. So um, at least from the University of Wessex's point, point of view, uh, this whole area of uh, data science, analytics, and big data for the universities is a strategic priority. So alongside the center, the university has also founded uh, an, an institute, uh, which is working very closely with, with the center. So we have some capacity to undertake some of that work as part of that. But you are absolutely right, it's, it's not easy. You need to have, you need to secure funding to do the kind of work that we are doing. And I think this is one of the reasons why we have been given additional funding to continue with the work of the center, because there is real value that we can deliver and we have been delivering. So hopefully, long this may continue. Uh, and uh, I guess in Essex, we're trying to kind of set up a culture through the kind of ECTA program where we are able to kind of more sustainably do these types of projects ourselves. So they were drawing heavily on the kind of expertise in, in these kind of early stages, but gradually maybe 
tone it down slightly. So as we kind of develop the skills our, ourselves to be able to do it, I mean, that's our kind of uh, ideology to make it a bit more sustainable in the long term. Okay, I'm aware of time, and I think we can bring this session and panel discussion to a close. I think